the order for evening prayer daily throughout the year. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Lord, you've promised to be our teacher and our professor. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We've offended against thy holy laws. We've left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we've done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he should turn from his wickedness and live, has given assurance and pardon, assurance of pardon and remission to those who unfeignedly repent and embrace Jesus Christ. Wherefore, let us ever beseech him to grant us true repentance and the power of his Holy Spirit that those things which we are doing at the present time may be pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end. We turn our attention now to Augustine, we're in Justo Gonzalez's story of Christianity. Augustine, when I thought of devoting myself entirely to you, my God, it was that I wish that I wished to do it and that I wished not to do it. It was I. And since I neither completely wished nor completely refused, I fought against myself and tore myself to pieces. Take up and read, take up and read, take up and read. These words probably shouted by a playing child floated over the fence of the garden in Milan and struck the ears of the dejected professor of rhetoric who sat under a fig tree and cried, How long, Lord, how long? Will it be tomorrow or always tomorrow? Why does my uncleanliness not end at this very moment? The child's words seemed to him words from heaven. Shout shortly before elsewhere in the garden, he had put down a manuscript he was reading. Now he returned to the spot took up the manuscript and read the words of Paul, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision to, for the flesh to gratify its desires. Responding to these words, Augustine, for that was the name of the rhetorician, made a decision he had been long postponing for a long time. He devoted himself to the service of God. 
soon he abandoned his career as a professor and set on a course that would eventually make him one of the most influential figures in the entire history of the church. In order to understand the scope and meaning of the experience in the Garden of Milan, one must follow Augustine's career to that point, a tortuous pass, path to faith. Augustine was born in 354 in the little town of Tagast in North Africa. His father was a minor Roman official who followed the traditional pagan religion. But his mother, Monica, was a fervent Christian whose constant prayer for her husband's conversion was eventually answered. Augustine does not seem to have been very close to his father, whom he hardly mentions in his writings. But Monica did play an important part in his, a role in his life, sometimes even an overwhelming one in the life of her only son. Both parents were aware of their son's exceptional gifts, and therefore sought for him the best education possible. To that end, they sent him to a nearby town of Medura until their resources ran out, when Augustine had to abandon his studies and return to Tagast. There, according to his own report, he wandered with many companions through the public square of Babylon and wallowed in their mud as if it were cinnamon and precious ointment. With these friends, he boasted of sexual adventures real or imagined and joined in capers that one day would rule, rule the sign of his own sinfulness. Eventually, thanks to the support of a certain Romani, Romanius, he was able to travel to Carthage to pursue his studies. Augustine was some 17 years old when he arrived at the great city that for centuries had been the political, economic, and cultural center of Latin-speaking Africa. Although he did not neglect his studies, <clears throat> he set out to enjoy the many pleasures that the city offered. Soon he had a concubine who bore him a son. He named the boy Adeodatus, meaning given by God or by a God. As all young men of his time preparing for careers as lawyers or public functionaries, Augustine was a student of rhetoric purpose of this discipline was to learn to speak and to write elegantly and convincingly. Truth was not the issue. That was left for the professors of philosophy. But among the many ancient works, the students of rhetoric had to read those of Cicero, the famous orator of classical Rome. And Cicero, besides being a master of language, was a philosopher. Thus, it was reading Cicero that Augustine came to the conviction that proper style and speech were not sufficient. One must also seek the truth. The search led the young student to Manichaeanism. The religion was Persian in origin having been founded by a certain Manny in the third century. According to Manny, the human predicament is the presence in each of us of two principles. One he calls the light is spiritual, the other the darkness. Throughout the universe, these two principles, both the eternal light and darkness, somehow Manichaean the Keans explained it through a series of myths. The two have intermingled, and the present human condition is the result of this admixture. Salvation then consists in separating the two elements and in preparing our spirit for its return to the realm of pure light, which it will be fully absorbed. 
since no mingling of the principles is evil, elite believers must avoid procreation. According to Matty, this doctrine had been revealed in various fashions to a long series of prophets, including Buddha, Zoroaster, Jesus, and Manny himself. In Augustine's time, Manichaeanism had spread throughout the Mediterranean basin. Its main appeal was its claim to be eminently rational. Like Gnosticism, Manichaeanism based many of its teachings on astronomical observation to be resumed in our next second evening prayer. We reflect now with Professor Millard Erickson in his Christian theology on immanentism in theology. Liberalism, as he calls it, which we call decadent theology, also modified the traditional view and person of work of Jesus Christ. Orthodoxy or conservative Christianity had insisted that Jesus was qualitatively different from all human beings, possessed of two natures, divine and human. With the movement towards synthesizing divine and human into one, this distinction, distinctiveness of Jesus became relativized. Jesus was different from other human beings, but only in degree, not in kind. He was the man with the greatest God consciousness, according to Friedrich, Friedrich Schleiermacher, or the man who most fully discovered God, or the person in whom God fully dwelt. Again, according to Don Bailey, a prominent advocate of this view was W. Robertson Smith, a Scottish theologian who was tried for heresy. One charge of which he was accused was denial of the divinity of Jesus. Deeply hurt, he exclaimed, how can they accuse me of that? I've never divided denied the divinity of any man, let alone Jesus. To give a more personal example, when in a series of ecumenical radio dialogues in which I participated, someone emphasized that Jesus was unique. A process theologian exclaimed, Jesus, unique? Every human being that has ever lived is unique. Varying degrees of this view can be found. In all cases, the underlying assumption is that if God is immanent within humanity, he is immanent with all persons in the same sense. While there is a quantitative difference in the extent to which God is present in various individuals, there's no qualitative difference in the manner of his presence not even in Christ. Another version of immanentism is Paul Tillich, who saw himself as in many ways standing on the boundary between different groups and movements. In particular, he viewed himself as occupying a middle position between liberalism and neo-orthodoxy. In many ways, his most distinctive idea was his doctrine of God. God, for Tillich, was not a being, one being among many. In conventional theism, God is the supreme being, the greatest being, the unlimited being, but still a being, over against all other beings which are finite. He stands out of them and outside of him. For Tillich, however, God is not a being. He is a being itself or the ground of being. He is that internal power or force which causes everything to exist. Thus, whereas all finite beings exist, God does not exist. While this may sound like a derogatory statement about God, it is not so. Some have thought that Tillich was an atheist because he said that God does not exist. 
There's even a story that when Tillich was teaching at Harvard Divinity School, the wife of a faculty member in another department of the university demanded that Tillich be dismissed. For an atheist to teach in the divinity school seemed to her to be a contradiction of terms. But Tillich's statement that God does not exist was not derogatory, it was a compliment. When he said that God does not exist, God meant that uh, God does not merely exist. God is. Finite beings exist. God is, it is the basis of the existence of everything that exists. God is present within everything that is, but he is not to be equated with everything that is. Thus, Tillich's view is not pantheism. It is more accurately called panentheism. It is not accurate to say that for Tillich, God and everything that exists are identical. Rather, for Tillich, God is in everything. If one kicks a tree or stone, he cannot correctly say, I just kicked God. But he could say, I kicked something in which God is. The relationship of God to all finite objects within the world is something like the relationship of sap to a tree. It is not the tree, but is the vital force within the tree. But although God is the basis of existence of every object, he cannot be known by a superficial knowledge of any object or set of objects. He is the depth within everything that is. He is the deep internal force causing it to be rather than not be. Thus, there is a type of transcendence here, quite unconventional in its nature. God is not outside objects. When someone has a very deep relationship with another person, he is experiencing the transcendent God. In such a situation, one is aware that the ground of his own being is the same as the ground of another person's being. One can have a similar experience with beings which are other than human, animals, plants, inanimate nature. In getting beyond a surface acquaintance with these objects, one is relating to God. We'll resume that in our next instance. As we turn to Chris Edward Cairns at Christianity through the ages, and we've been talking about the Italian Renaissance in Florence. We'll pick up here with John Collet, who was in Florence 1467 to 1519, roughly contemporaneous with Erasmus, was one of a group in England who were known as the Oxford Reformers. After his visit to Italy, Collet began to lecture to develop the literal meaning of the Pauline epistles. This was an innovation because former theologians had been interested only in allegory, more in that than they were in what the writer of scripture was trying to say. The work of the Oxford reformers was a contributing former factor to the coming of Reformation in England. Brooklyn and Erasmus, also Florentine attendees, were, however, the most influential of the humanists because of the influence of their work was felt over all Europe. John Rooklyn, a contemporary of Collet, 1455 to 1522, had studied under Pico in Italy and had developed a taste for Hebrew language. Old Testament was, combi was combi a combined Hebrew grammar and dictionary, which he called on the elements of Hebrew. The work helped others become familiar with the tongue of the Old Testament so they could study the book in the original languages. It is a matter of interest that Wuklin gave advice concerning the education of Melanchthon 
Luther's right-hand man and the first theologian of the Reformation. Desiderius Erasmus, 1466 to 1536, was even more influential than Ruklin. He received part of his early education in the School of the Brethren of Common Life in Deventer, and later studied at many of the universities of Europe and England. He became a universal scholar who was at home in the cultured circles in any land. His scholarly pursuit and spirit inclined him to reform rather than revolution. And his negative abuse, opposition to the abuses of the Roman Church was expressed in his books, The Praise of Folly, 1510, and Familiar Colloquies, 1518. In these books, Erasmus attempted by clever satire to point out the evils of the life of the priestly and monastic hierarchy. The positive aspect of his work was the Greek New Testament, published in 1516 by the publisher Froben, Froben of Basel, who was desirous of getting the fame and market that would accompany the publication of the first printed and published Greek New Testament. The Spanish scholar Ximenes had a Greek New Testament printed in 1514, but he could not sell it until the Pope approved. In order to reach the market before him, Froben urged Erasmus on. Erasmus used four Greek manuscripts which were available in Basel, Basel. But when he found that the last verses of Revelation were misspelled in all of them, he translated the Latin back into what he thought the Greek should be. The influence of the book was tremendous, for scholars were now in a position to make accurate comparison between the church that they saw in the New Testament and the church of their day. The comparison was decidedly unfavorable to the latter. At first, Erasmus sympathized with Luther, but later opposed him because he did not want to break with the Roman Catholic Church. Moreover, his theology differed greatly from that which Luther held in his book, Free Will, 1524. He emphasized the reform of abuses rather than an attack upon doctrine and upheld the freedom of the will, which Luther said was completely bound as far as salvation was concerned. Both in Northern and Southern Europe, the Renaissance had abiding results. The study of the classical pagan past led to a secular approach to life in which religion was reduced to a formal affair or ignored until one came to the hour of death. The ideal of the person as an independent human being with a right to develop as his tastes led him took precedence over the medieval idea of the one who was saved by taking his humble place in the corporate hierarchical society of the Roman Catholic Church. The impetus given to the use of the vernacular by the scholars and poets of the 14th and 15th century Europe was helpful later in bringing to the people the Bible and the services of the church in their mother tongue. The return to sources of culture from the past and scientific study of them made possible a far more accurate knowledge of the Bible than had been the case before this time. In the political realm, the amoral note struck in Machiavelli's The Prince led to the ignoring of moral principles in the conduct of foreign affairs of the city-states of Italy and to the rising nation-states of Northern Europe. One seeks a balanced view of the impact of the Renaissance can call it neither a tragedy nor an unmixed blessing. We'll have to consider it a mixture of blessing and bane 
to the people of Europe. Um, we turn with Greg Alliston's historical theology on the person of Christ in the modern period. We discuss something of the canonicists in the Lutheran community. We'll take that up here. Following his state of humiliation, the Son of God experienced exaltation, a continuation of unlimited freedom and absolute powerfulness of not life. As the exalted one, he must now be in full possession of the divine glory of which he divested himself. We may say that the glorified Christ is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. The canonic Christology originated by Tomasius attracted some followers, but most followers considered it, most other Christians considered it to be at odds with the Chalcedonian formulation of the Incarnation. It would be revived and rendered more sophisticated by later theologians, though it has never been considered to be in accord, in accord with Orthodox Christology. Beyond this canonic model, the modern period witnessed the undoing of the Church's historic consensus in Christology. Frederick, Frederick, Frederick Schleiermacher reinterpreted religion in terms of a feeling of absolute dependence upon the world spirit, which he called God. <clears throat> in keeping with his theological realignment, which we would call decadence, Schleiermacher presented Jesus as the ideal in whom this God consciousness had reached an apex, a religious consciousness different only in decree, degree, not kind. Quote, his particular spiritual content cannot be explained by the content of the human environment to which he belonged, but only to the universal source of spiritual life in virtue of a creative divine act in which is an absolute maximum, the conception of man as the subject of God consciousness comes to completion. Techno mumbo jumbo. In keeping with this ideal, Schleiermacher revisioned, revisioned the sinlessness of Christ as the gradual yet complete submission of his self-consciousness to God consciousness, quote, no impression was taken up merely serious, sensuously into the innermost consciousness and elaborated apart from God consciousness into an element of life, nor did any action ever proceed solely from the sense nature and not from God consciousness. For Schleiermacher, quote, the Redeemer then is like all men in virtue of identity with human nature, but distinguished from them by the constant potency of his God consciousness. This is pietism on steroids. More specifically, quote, to ascribe to Christ an absolutely powerful God consciousness and to attribute to him an existence of God in him are exactly the same thing. In other words, Christ fully experienced absolute dependence on God consciousness, and this reality was what rendered him unique, yet similar to all human beings. Schleiermacher's reformulated Christology influenced many theologians who further revised the doctrine. Even though the quest for the historical Jesus by decadent Protestants actually had begun some decades earlier, Herman Samuel Ramaris drove a wedge between what the real Jesus of Nazareth was about 
and what his disciples dreamed and finally wrote that he was about. Following in Schleiermacher's footsteps, David Friedrich Strauss revisioned or revised the Bible as a myth. And then having dismissed the portrait of Jesus painted by the New Testament authors, reinterpreted, I'll add the word decadently, Christ along the theological lines of Schleiermacher's ideal man. Martin Collar erected a dichotomy between the historical Jesus of Nazareth and the Christ of Scripture, maintaining, quote, we do not possess any sources for a life of Jesus that a historian can accept as reliable and adequate. Accordingly, quote, the risen Lord is not the historical Jesus behind the Gospels, but the Christ of apostolic preaching of the whole New Testament. Therefore, we speak of the historic Christ of the Bible. In the view of Albert Schweitzer, Jesus was steeped in the eschatological doctrine of his time. Fueled by this great expectation, Jesus died attempting to bring the kingdom of God violently Yet his hopes for this eschatological event were dashed. Quoting Schweitzer in the quest for the historical Jesus, in the knowledge that he is the coming son of man, Jesus lays hold of the wheel of the world to set it moving in the last revolution that is to bring all ordinary history to a close. It refuses in to turn, and he throws himself upon it. Then it does turn, and it crushes him. Instead of bringing in the eschatological considerations, he has destroyed them. The wheels roll onward in the mangled body of the one me- immeasurably great man who is strong enough to think of himself as spiritual ruler of mankind and to bend history to his purpose is hanging upon it still. That is his victory and reign. Rudolf Bultmann erected a dichotomy between the historical Jesus and what he called the charismatic Christ of faith. You don't need the history of the Gospels, just some Gnostic something up there, asserting that the former, the historical Jesus, was unimportant, and the latter was what really mattered for the church. Hang around long enough, and Boltman will tell you who Jesus is out of the fancies and fictions of his own depraved intellect. According to Boltman, I do indeed think that we can now know almost nothing concerning the life and personality of Jesus, since the early Christian sources show no interest in either. Please, oh, Boltman, goodbye, Boltman, strike up the brass band, sergeant major of the guard, collar him and leapfrog him to the western exit. The charismatic Christ of faith, the one who was preached by the first disciples, is the product of the early Christian community and is covered with mythology. The encrustation demands that the church engage in demythologizing or removing the mythical elements so as to recover the deeper existential meaning of the New Testament portrait of Jesus. We turn our attention to John McNeil, the history and character of Calvinism. Calvin, Geneva under Calvin's sway. Thereafter, he menaced Geneva, where his ancestors had held old sway. Alarmed but resolute, Geneva prayed and armed against him. 
late in October, a fresh disputation was sent to Byrne, where finally the sense of common danger overcame the antagonism of the previous years. John Knox exulted in the divine deliverance by which Geneva's old ally was taught to remember her duty. On January 1558, Calvin wrote to Francis Hockman, the distinguished jurist, Yesterday at last, after many bickerings, a perpetual pact with the Bernese was confirmed by oath. He added realistically, however, I don't think the strife is over. Biza informed Farrell of incredible jubilation in Geneva, quoting, Blessed be the Lord who hath scattered the devices of the wicked. The advantage gained from Calvin's point of view was that thereafter, the points of disagreement were to be settled upon equal terms by arbitration. Byrne had, in fact, for the first time conceded equality to her neighbor and ally. The Peronists were left without overt political support. The Duke of Savoy prudently withdrew. But the alarm was soon again sounded in France, and Spain ended their last war of the century by the Treaty of Cato Cambrisis to April 1559 and a project to crush Geneva was entertained by both parties. Alva, the Spanish general who fought against the Pope and would later ravage the Netherlands, was invited by the Constable of France to conduct the attack. But he declined the task and advised his king, Philip II, against it. With great energy, Geneva prepared her defenses the Duke of Savoy, however, began active negotiations to bring Geneva peacefully to submission. The Savoyard noble in Geneva for presenting the Duke's claims met only courteous but resolute rejection. On one September, Amblard Corn, representing the council, firmly told him, for the sovereignty of God and the word of God, we will adventure our lives. Another of the magistrates summed up the Genevan polity in the words, to recommend ourselves to God and to keep a good watch. These spirited replies pleased, phrased in the very language of Calvin, eloquently testified to the spirit of the reformed city that was to stand, prayerful and alert, though many through many a crisis. In December, a gracious emissary, emissary of Savoy, a bishop-elect, was honorably received by the Genovese, but departed with no other answer than that they wished to be the Duke's good neighbor. It was 44 years later that Savoy attacked. Meanwhile, the religious and moral transformation of Geneva proceeded under the stimulation of an exposed position, but with little sense of immediate peril from her neighbors. Since 1541, Geneva had already been changed in a large degree. With each of Calvin's battles, the opposition of his policy had been weakened, and now, while the discipline was still infringed in detail, it was no longer challenged in principle. The attitude of many people was like that of Amblard Corn, mentioned above. In 1546, he'd been a syndic and president of the consistory. Yet he was among those involved in the dancing case in which the Favor family were the principals. He had then humbly accepted the censure of the consistory and had thereafter been a loyal supporter of discipline. But in no small degree, the change in Geneva was due to the immigration of refugees from persecution elsewhere. The years of Calvin's growing control correspond to a period of fresh, severe repression in Italy, 
1542 of the extensive and sanguinary persecutions of Henry II in France, 1547 to 1559, and Mary Tudor in England, 1553 to 1558, and of the increasing severity against Protestants in the Netherlands, which Philip II took over from Charles V in 1555. From many countries, frightened refugees poured into Geneva, more than replacing in numbers the fugitive libertines. Most of them came in poverty, as new to them as their new environment. In the period 1549 to 1559, not less than 5,017 new inhabitants were admitted to the residents of the city. Of these, Domergird states that 1,708 came in 1509. Roger places the number for that year at 1680 and remarks that of these 685 came in the month of May. In 1559, however, only 58 regis refugees became citizens, of whom Calvin was one. The policy of Geneva differed sharply from that of Zurich, Bern, and Basel in its liberal admission of the refugees to citizenship and hospitality. This was Calvin's policy, and as we've seen, its full adoption in 1555 was crucial for its success. Those who became citizens were prevailingly French-speaking, since by language they could better than others participate in the town life and politics. The distinction of a few of these, such as the learned sons of the great Paris Hellenist, Willem Boud, Nicholas, and Leon Colladin from Barry, the Noyon official, yeah, we shall pick that up. Now confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O oh Lord, save them that rule, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Do thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O oh Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O oh Lord, because there is no one else who fights for us. God, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. O Lord, from, all, from whom all good things come, grant to us thy humble servants that by thy inspiration we may think only those things that are good, and by thy merciful guidance may perform the same through Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in whom standeth our eternal life. Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Lighten our darkness, O Lord, we beseech thee, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee. And you've promised that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you will grant the requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all evermore. Amen. Here ends the order for evening prayer daily throughout the year. Godspeed.